do you go to when you're making a big decision? In Mark chapter 7, Jesus shows us that the authorities we go to, even religious ones, well, we can use them to cover over our rebellion against God. We need to listen to the alternative. And please consider joining us live on Wednesdays from your workplace, 1pm Dublin time on Zoom. It's a simple way of identifying as a Christian in your workplace. Simply use the link bit.ly slash Dublin Bible Talks. That's bit.ly slash Dublin Bible Talks. Well, last week we looked at the reception that Jesus received when he went to his own town and to the reception that John the Baptist re received from Herod, who beheaded him. And after that, there are two other things that happened before chapter 7, famous things, the feeding the 5,000 and the walking on the lake. And we see the disciples' fear of the one who can walk on water, but we're told in chapter 6, verse 52, that they still don't understand what's happening. They've got hard hearts. They don't see the link reminding of God's rescue of his people from slavery in Egypt. The, the people fed in the wilderness and the people saved through the water. Even these men's hearts, these men who have been so close to Jesus, are as hard-hearted as Pharaoh in the Old Testament. And now we come to a conversation at the beginning of Mark chapter 7. And to help us understand the significance of this conversation, we need to think for a couple of minutes about the big dilemma of our society. There's a big question, and is where shall we look? As our society and culture makes big decisions about big issues, things like what does it mean to be a man, what does it mean to be a woman, questions about whether there are any boundaries at all in the use of sex, and if so, where are they? Questions about what is the value of life, when does it start, when does it end? And how do we respond to how we think different, how, how, to people who think differently to ourselves? Where do we go to look for wisdom and guidance as a society? Where do we go as a culture? Now, it's also an issue not on that societal level, but it's also an issue on our personal and individual levels. We find we're not as sure of things as people in previous generations were quite certain about. I mean, take work, for example. In previous generations, the purpose of work was very clear and it was agreed by everyone. The purpose of work was to provide. And to provide was regarding the necessities of life. Provide shelter, provide warmth, provide food. But it was also defined socially, not just providing for you, yourself, but also providing for your family and also to the community. But that's no longer how people think about work, is it? What work you choose to do is not primarily a question of survival, but a question of identity and a question of happiness. And if work does not make you happy, it doesn't matter that it's providing for you. Many people think if it's not making me happy, it's not worth it. I'll find something else. And if it's and, and work is less about your family or your community. It's about the individual. Does it bring you joy? Does it, make, does it bring fulfilment to you? But why has that changed? By what authority? Why do we think that the purpose of work is different to the previous generations? The recent Barbie movie addresses this kind of issue. And the theme song by Billie Eilish, I think, is quite a magnificent song particularly a performance at the Grammys. It, but it asks the question, what was I made for? That's the question that many of our society are asking. But the big question of the song is actually not found in the lyrics. The big question of the song is not, what am I made for? The big question raised by the song is, who is she asking? I mean, if she doesn't know, she can't be asking herself because she'd be asking someone who's ignorant. She's recognising she doesn't know, so why would she ask herself? And the society has changed and is giving her conflicting answers to what she once knew. She is unstable in that. And society is unstable in that. How can she trust the answer of society? Who can answer the question in a way that I can trust with certainty, with authority? Of course, we always do rely on some kind of authority, whether it's consciously or unconsciously. Our lives are shaped by things we happen to accept. If you've lived in another culture, sometimes you're more aware of this. 
because you find that what you've thought was the most sensible thing in all your life to do is not universally accepted by the people you're now living among. Something as simple as buying something at a shop. Uh, we wait in line, don't we? But when I found I wanted to buy a suite in a shop in Israel, people kept on jumping in front of me. And that was normal. If you wanted service in that culture, you had to go and get it. You didn't wait for it to be given. But why do we wait to receive and they go and get it? Where, where do we get that idea of behaviour from? Oh, tradition is one source of authority, where the wisdom of the past or the practice of the past is used as the basis for a decision we make in the present. The reason we do that is long forgotten. It might not be remembered at all. But of course there's a problem with that, because tradition resists all change, even change for the better. My first workplace had a person whose job involved re receiving a document every morning and every evening on a fax machine. Does anyone know what a fax machine is anymore? Um, but they would receive that and then send it on to another number before, and then made three copies of it and filed it in three different places. Well, the thing is, no one knew where the document came from. No one understood what was on it. No one understood where it was sent to. No one looked after any of the files or looked at them, and yet it was done day in, day out, without any question. Tradition isn't a great source of authority. All the time. <laughs> Every society has taboos, questions that are an authority of what we don't talk about. Not because there's a law against it, just because it's not done. But taboos can be wrong, can't they? Taboos can lead to things like the mother and baby homes in... Ireland. Everyone knows it's happening, but no one talks about it. Science, our parents and grandparents trusted that as the great source of authority, the answer to all our problems. But science can only tell you what we can do. It can't tell us what we should do. And when it comes to what we should do, our society looks to things like community attitudes. I mean, the worst thing you can do is be out of the step, out of step with prevailing opinion. But where does community get its attitudes? And so trust in community or trust, and trust in democracy, you will notice, is diminishing. Replaced, I think, by the authority of personal feelings. Recently, I was talking to a young girl in the guides, um, and the primary pledge of the guides had changed. It no longer refers to God, but what they've entered is that they should be true to themselves. But when I asked her what this meant, she said, listen to this, this is what she said, Whatever I do, at the time that I do it, is always right. Now that's terrifying. But the answer is within you, and trust your gut, and let your feelings be your guide, are so common in our culture, aren't they? As an authority. Of course, there's also religion. Church leaders voicing an opinion in the public square used to be a strong source of authority, but church leaders, particularly in Ireland, are no longer trusted. At best, they're irrelevant. Many regard them as an oppressive force that we've now found our freedom from, and so we no longer expect or look to wisdom and guidance from there. And all of that is just to say there are any number of sources where people go to for guidance in different circumstances, at different times, in giving different weight when they make decisions. And it's worth asking, what do I look to? What are the authorities that shape me, that I go to when I'm wanting to make a decision? Because most of the time we don't really think about it, we just decide, we just do something. But you live in a particular way, don't you? Certain things matter to us and other things don't. What are the influences that have made me like I am? What wisdom have I accepted and taken as my authority? And with all of that in mind, let's listen to the conversation between Jesus and a certain number of his contemporaries. And immediately we begin to hear what a different society it was in which this conversation took place. How they're very different from us in very many ways and they have very different concerns. But as we listen, we will also get a glimpse as to why the influence of Jesus Christ has had such a significant impact on the world through the centuries. The issues that... Uh, the, the issue is... 
in this passage, what sources of guidance, what sources of authority, what drives this conversation we're about to have a look at? Look again now at Mark chapter 7, verse 1. Listen to it with me. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. Now, now that was not a matter of hygiene. That's what we would be thinking, isn't it, in our modern culture? But for them, it had nothing to do with hygiene. They didn't think that way. They didn't know about germs and that kind of stuff in the same way as we do. And Mark explains that in verse 3. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the traditions of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other kinds of traditions, such as washing of cups and pitchers and kettles. Now, it's interesting, isn't it, that Mark has to say that. It indicates that the people he's speaking to, the people who first received this, were not as familiar with Jewish customs and were probably not Jewish themselves, uh, someone like me. But it's an example of... He's talking about an example of people impacted by a religious tradition for guidance in almost every part of life. The religious traditions that the Jewish people had gave them any number of different cultures, uh, customs. Now, modern Western culture likes to think that it's moved away from such religious traditions, but I'm not convinced. And there is a telltale sign that you're dealing with a religious tradition in your culture. What tells you that a religious tradition is present? Look at verse 5. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of our elders instead of eating their food instead of eating their food with defiled hands? The sign that you've found a religious tradition in a culture is when you find someone taking offence when you don't conform to their ways. Think about that for a moment. When your preferred ways are just things that have been passed down from the past, not talking about a moral issue necessarily, but your just preferred way of doing things, not just in a church but in everyday life, around the dinner table and things like that, when you take offence at someone who criticises the way you do something or someone does it differently to the way you're used to it, there's a religious dimension to the offence you feel in that moment. I'm going to resist the temptation to give an example because then we'll focus on the example that I give. But I want you to think of things that you might find fit that definition of a religious tradition in that broad sense. Ways of doing things, practices where people in the area where we live or in the community we live in or the country we live in might take offence if you did it differently. Well, look at what Jesus had to say to these people who lived by this religious tradition. And notice that Jesus is very shocking in his response. Verse 6, he replied, Jesus was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written, these people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You've let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. What is the problem with the religious traditions? Well, these things have their place. There's a very great foolishness where at the same time as clinging to them, we let go of God, however. And Jesus calls that hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is the contradiction between what a person seems to be in the opinion of others and what he actually is before God. Look at how Jesus continues in verse 9. You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. Isn't it interesting as we think about the sources of wisdom and guidance that our society looks to, that we did not immediately think about the commands of God? And that's because we live in a thoroughly pagan society, a society that doesn't look to the commands of God. But what about you? (laughs) Do you see that from Jesus' perspective, there is an enormous problem to be addressed here? 
He says to these people, You have set aside the commands of God in order to observe the things that matter to you. He's describing something that's nothing less than rebellion against God. And interestingly enough, he's talking with the most sincerely religious people of his time. Jesus highlights one example in verse 10 that was existing in that culture at that time. Verse 10, for Moses said, honour your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. Now that's a command of God given to the Israelites in the Old Testament. And it might sound severe to our modern ears, and it's not God's command for modern society or Christian community now, but it was the command of God given to his people in those days when the survival of his people was at stake. But it does communicate very clearly how seriously God takes family responsibility, doesn't it? But honouring your father and mother is difficult. It was difficult then and it can be difficult now. And so they, like us, set aside the command of God in order to observe their own tradition, in order to do what they wanted to. Verse 11, But you say that if anyone declares what might might have been used to help their father and mother is Corban, that is, devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father and mother. See, what they do is say, yeah, I should use some of this money for my parents. But you know what? This bit of money isn't really mine. It's God's. So it would be wrong to use it to care for my parents. But then they would somehow find a way of using that money they'd set aside for their own for their own use. You see, they've taken religion. They've taken a religious tradition and made that a substitute for taking God seriously. I remember a young man, a youth group, um, he, he, he was really keen about his faith. Uh, but his parents had said to him, look, you can't go to Bible study on a Wednesday night. You've, you've got to stay home and do your work. But they would climb out the window of their parents' house and go to Bible study. Now, going to Bible study on Wednesday night might be a good thing to do, but it's a human tradition, not a command of God. You won't find that command in the Bible. But you will find in your Bible, honour your father and your mother. (laughs) The leader of that youth group, of that Bible study, would often take that person home. So he would honour his father and his mother. Friends, where do we do things like this? Setting aside the commands of God in order to do what we want. Oh, what you might want to do might be a good thing. Otherwise, you wouldn't feel justified in setting God's opinion aside. Your career, your family, what are you so committed to keeping that you'll put aside God's commands in order to be committed to those things? Jesus says in verse 13, Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And you do many things like that. Now that is a very hard word from Jesus. And we see why he's so strong about this in a minute. But first, consider this with me. Just imagine that this conversation was between you and Jesus. Much of it would have been very different. But what would Jesus say you have done with the word of God? He said to those people, in what way, you, in that way, you nullify, you make nothing the word of God. Now, If you're anything like me, you're immediately thinking of all the ways that other people do that. All the ways that other people you have seen have made other things more important than God's word. But that's not what I'm asking you. That's not what I'm asking me. What I'm asking is in what ways you are tempted, in what ways you have made nothing the word of God and put something else in its place treated the word of God in your life as if it's a nothing. What would Jesus say you have done to the word of God? It might have been doing charity work instead of going to church. Doesn't that look good? And yet meeting with God's people, sitting under God's word together. It might be difficult, 
but they are the people who are your family. You see how easy it is to take something good and place it in the way of God's commands? By the word of God, he meant the scriptures, the Bible. At that time, it was all of the Old Testament. But for us, this side of the cross, it's the whole Bible, Old and New Testament. What would you have said? What, what would you say that you have done to the word of God? Would he, would Jesus by any chance, have a reason to say to you, you have nullified the word of God by your commitment to what you want to be committed to? Now, the reason Jesus is so stern and severe about this becomes clear at the end of the conversation in verse 14. There's a crowd of people who've been listening into the conversation, much like we are as we're listening to this. And so Jesus speaks to them. Jesus speaks to us. Verse 14, again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it's what comes out of a person that defiles them. That might be a bit strange to us, but it was very important in Jewish thinking. Thinking that came from the Old Testament, where the words clean and unclean, the word defile, it, 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 it's relating to being acceptable or unacceptable to God. And one of the biggest issues in life has got to be what makes a person acceptable or unacceptable to God. The very great problem with the religious traditions is that it blurs, it can make confusing the answer to that question. If you have a lot of religious traditions, it makes people think, oh, if I can keep all these traditions, then that will make me acceptable to God. Or they start to think, if I don't keep up all these traditions, that will make me unacceptable to God. But Jesus says no. It's nothing from the outside, nothing that you do on the outside that makes a person acceptable to God. It's something inside. Now, you'll notice something of the hard-heartedness of the disciples because they're puzzled by this. And maybe you are too. Maybe you're quite glad that they ask the question that we find in verse 17 and following. After he left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull? He asked, don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? Because it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach and then out of the body. <laughs> In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. Don't you see, Jesus says, these religious traditions that matter to you so much actually don't matter to God at all. They don't really impact at all your acceptability to God. Now, the topic of this conversation was about eating food. Jesus graphically outlines that the problem between us and God is not our stomachs, it's our hearts. It's the core of our identity. Now, are you ready to hear exactly what he means? Because sit tight, he's about to say it in verse 20. He went on and he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within it is out of a person's heart that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. Jesus is saying that the human problem is a huge problem. Because when God looks into our hearts, into the core of our being... He does not like what he sees. God doesn't see the front that we present to other people. The front we present to other people is usually a pretty good one. We're able to pull off that deception most of the time. Others have opinions of us that we've been careful to manufacture, to curate and to maintain, but God doesn't see them he sees through them he sees what's really there and actually we can see what's really there because they come out in things like this on the list that jesus gives that we try so hard to cover up but we know we do them when we know we think them did you notice that it's not just evil actions in that list but god judges our thoughts friends i find this really difficult to read, don't you? 
I mean, almost all of us will be thinking about now, I'm, I'm, I'm not really all that keen on listening to this. I'm going to sit here and look as if I'm listening. But I'm blowed if I'm actually going to listen to this kind of stuff. Now, it's difficult. And you might even find it offensive to be made look deeply at yourself into your heart. But notice that this is what King Jesus is calling us to do. What about your heart? Has anything like this ever come out of your heart? Are you prepared to listen, to, to hear? I mean, it's up to you. You don't have to. But is your heart like this? Evil thoughts? Sexual immorality? Theft? Murder? Adultery? Greed? Malice? Wishing bad things on people? Deceit? Lewdness? Envy? Slander? Arrogance? Foolishness? All those kinds of things come from inside us. That's what makes us unclean. That's what makes us unacceptable to God. And that's our problem. And religious traditions, and whatever else we might find ourselves committed to, whether it's taboos or social attitudes or science or whatever authority for wisdom and guidance we use to shape our decisions, they can't do anything to help us with that. So what on earth can help? Jesus has spoken as severely as he has precisely because it is the word of God that can help. Only the word of God can help us with this. That which we tend to push away is the only thing that can be of help to us. But it's not a help in the way that most people think. It doesn't help in the, mo in the way that most people think it's going to help. You've heard even in this conversation that we've been listening into that Jesus speaks out about the word of God and the commands of God. And we tend to think that's God's standards and I know I don't meet them, so how is that going to help? That's only going to make me feel worse. Ugh, no, you've misunderstood. The word of God that Jesus is pointing us to is the extraordinary news of forgiveness. What Mark has been recording and we've been studying together as Jesus' teaching. Do you, do you remember what Jesus has been saying? The time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. The Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Dear friends, the word of God is God's call to turn back to him, to receive the cleansing, to receive the forgiveness, to receive a new heart, to receive what Jesus died on the cross to give us. So today, as we take a lunch break, we should stop setting aside the word of God in order to do what we'd prefer to do, we must stop nullifying the word of God. But instead, dear friends, let's hear it. Let's hear his call to turn back to him, to be cleansed, to be forgiven, and take that message out to our colleagues. For that is the word of God they need to hear. Thank you for listening to the recording of the Dublin Bible Talks. You can join us in real time on Wednesdays at 1pm Dublin time on Zoom, bit.ly slash Dublin Bible Talks. That's bit.ly slash Dublin Bible Talks.